Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Astronaut Scholarship Awards and Q&A, question and answer period with, with astronaut Dick Covey. I am very happy to be here and so joyed to be able to welcome people over, even if it's over Zoom, so to speak, just over Zoom. I think that that will probably make our, our hour together a little bit more informal than it would usually be, but this is also um, the opportunity that we were looking for because we kind of like um, more quieter, not quieter, but intimate and smaller circle to be able to ask questions and really feel free to just um, get a conversation going. The pre there was an interview held earlier with Colonel Covey and Professor Collicott that you can find on YouTube. You would have received a link and hopefully you all watched it all already. And you have the basis for what we're going to be talking about and what you can ask questions about today. With us, we have today um, Jim Hayes, one of the sp sponsors of that Gene, the sponsor of the Gene Cernan Astronaut Scholarship. We have Tracy Woolley, daughter of Gene Cernan. Also, of course, Professor Stephen Collicott, who interviewed who's a professor of aeronautical and astronautical engineering. And he is uh, here in the room with us to also moderate and speak a little bit more with um, Colonel Covey. Astronaut Colonel Dick Covey, Purdue graduate. And of course, uh, he comes back to campus often. I wish that we could have him really on campus with us today, but, we, but we're doing what we can here. I also have our three astronaut scholars who are being honored, Maya Clare, Lindsay Wilson, and Zach Marshall. What we're going to do is we're going to begin with the, with the awarding or presenting or introduction, I guess is what we could best say. And uh, a few words also from those who are, who are here to do the presenting. And then after that, we will launch into the Q&A session. I would like to thank the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, who of course makes all of this possible. They have been partners with Purdue for, well, since the 1980s. We're one of the original circle of universities that is fortunate enough to receive an astronaut scholarship, traditionally one. As of this year, it is three, due to the generosity of Jim Hayes and also importantly, Mark and Sharon Hagel, who I believe are watching us being live streamed on, on YouTube. So Mark and Sharon Hagel, you aren't in the room with us technically today, but I would like to say thank you very, very much. Today, I would with, or with that, I will turn things over to Colonel Dick Covey. Well, thank you, Roseanne, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we have a distinct pleasure today of recognizing three very special Purdue students who've been selected for the prestigious award of being named an astronaut scholar. In 1984, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation was founded by the original Mercury 7 astronauts, their families and their friends. The goal for that foundation was to ensure that the United States would continue to be a global leader in science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, since that time, astronauts from all the subsequent human spaceflight programs, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Space Shuttle, my program, and the International Space Station have also embraced this mission. And many, like me, choose to serve the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation as uh, directors, trustees, donors, and supporters. It's very close to our hearts. The foundation partners with universities like Purdue, businesses, and individual donors to identify outstanding undergraduate university students who are pursuing science, technology, engineering, or math degrees, and then to recognize them as astronaut scholars. As astronaut scholars, they're eligible for monetary awards known nationwide as being one of the best merit-based scholarships available to undergraduate juniors and seniors. Since 1984, 
The foundation has recognized more than 600 scholars and we've awarded over $5 million in scholarships. Perhaps as important, in addition to awarding scholarships, the foundation maintains a lifelong relationship with each astronaut scholar and provides him or her with access to mentors, opportunities for personal and professional development, and chances to connect with astronauts, business executives and leaders, and other astronauts scholars from across the nation. We are here to, today to honor the three Purdue University astronaut scholars selected in 2020. Um, Purdue at this time is the only university that has more than two astronaut scholars selected each year. That's due in part to sponsorships um, for those scholarships. And of the first two that I will recognize today the first one, or one of them is sponsored by my wife, Kathy and me through the Covey Love Legacy Fund. And the other is sponsored by Purdue alumni, Mark and Sharon Hale. So without further ado, our first two scholars are Maya Claire, a senior majoring in biology with a focus on genetics, and Lindsay Wilson, who's also a senior majoring in biology. Maya and Lindsay, congratulations. It is now your opportunity to say a few words, beginning with Maya. Thank you, Mr. Covey. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Maya. I have the incredible and humbling honor of being here today, standing as one of the 2020 astronaut scholars. Um, and I just want to say how incredibly thankful I am for this honor. I have truly dreamed of being a scientist and a researcher my entire life. Um, and with the support of the scholarship, both of course monetarily and with the community, I feel like I've been able to achieve those goals. Um, I'll be going to graduate school next year to get my PhD. Um, I have com now completed over three years of research with the support of my mentors here at Purdue, including Dr. Matthew Olson and my graduate mentor, Alejandro Canaria, um, and of course the NISO office for supporting me through um, the process of applying to the scholarship. So. Thank you so much. Again, I am incredibly honored. Um, and yeah, thank you again. <laughs> okay, um, well, first of all, let me say how excited I was to receive this award. And uh, it's really, truly an honor to be recognized for my academic accomplishments and be among this collection of such bright minds. And um, I think the Astronaut Foundation does an excellent job of facilitating networking and providing resources for their members. And I've really enjoyed taking part in that. Um, my Astronaut Foundation mentor, uh, Joe Tanner, has been really nice in helping me prepare for my MD-PhD interviews. And he's also just a friend too. Um, and the funding too was tremendously helpful in making my senior year very smooth where I could focus on my research and my interviews. Um, I'm really excited. I've been accepted to MD-PhD for human genetics next year, so I couldn't be more grateful for the support that I've received from both the Astronaut Foundation and Purdue. Um, yeah, thank you so much everyone that's involved with this organization, the donors who graciously funded my scholarship, um, Joe and those who work with me at the NISO office, and then my parents and professors who just really have guided me along my journey. Um, I look forward to continued relationship with the ASF community and um, just pursuing my research interest as a physician scientist. So thank you so much. Hi, okay, I'll go ahead, Roseanne. I'm Tracy Cernan Woolley, and um, I'm glad to be a part of this today. Um, my dad was uh, very involved in the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, and it was very important to him because he um, believed in supporting the students of STEM, and he wanted to inspire them to achieve limits that they didn't really know they could achieve. There at Purdue, Dad often said it was one of the most defining moments um, of his life. When he left Purdue with a naval aviation orders in one hand and an engineering degree in the other hand, it opened doors uh, to his future that he could not even imagine. He often reflected that at Purdue is where he took his first steps into space. 
one day that he would actually call them in his home. Zach, my dad would be so impressed by your accomplishments there at Purdue and what your future holds ahead of you. His dream was to inspire students just like you. He would love the fact that when you walked by his photos at the Armstrong Engineering Hall of Fame Hall, it's a quick reminder that dreams are not impossible. As he would always say, shoot for the moon, one day you might surprise yourself. I'm honored to introduce you to a friend, Jim Hayes, who graciously sponsored this scholarship in dad's name here at Purdue. With this scholarship, Jim has paved the way to continue dad's amazing legacy as a pioneer in space exploration and also an inspiration to students, not only at Purdue, but at all over the country. Dad would have humbling said he is not deserving of this, but I know how much he would have appreciated it and how much it would meant to him as it does with me. With much gratitude, I thank you, Jim, for giving dad and his legacy this wonderful gift. I now introduce you to Jim Hayes. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I don't know if I'm on the screen or not. I can't tell. Am I good to go? You are. It's good. You're good to go. Got it. Everyone really knows the reason why I'm on this call. As Gene would say, it's to bring down the average IQ in the room. Uh, and trust me, I can hear him laughing right now. Seriously, Gene Cerno was a good friend of mine. I met him years ago with Neil Armstrong and other Purdue grad, along with Kobe. I don't understand what you guys feed people in Purdue, but it's uh, obviously very productive. Gene was a very positive force, an American hero, a forward-thinking guy. We need heroes in America today. Just watch the movie, The Last Man on the Moon, and you'll agree. He was smart as heck, always believing the future was bright. He knew we had to invest in the future. And that's what we're doing here today. Gene was, Gene was also very much a Purdue man, a great school, and as what is considered the best leader, Mitch Daniels. Mitch's missions include STEM leadership at Purdue University, which lines up exactly with what Gene Cernan was all about. You young students on the call are the superstars of, the, of today and tomorrow. You are the Gene Cernans of today. You give me, especially me, and everybody else, loads of hope in the future. I'm glad I can help. I look forward to meeting Zachary soon when this virus is finally brought under control. Obviously, in-person in meetings are always better. I think everybody agrees. And I want to introduce this year's CERN Memorial Scholarship recipient, Astronaut Scholarship, Zachary Marshall. I don't know if it's Zachary or Zach, but we're going with Zachary. It's all yours, Zach. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes, for this generous astronaut scholarship in recognition of Gene Cernan, an incredible engineer and pioneer. As an aeronautical and astronautical engineer student here at Purdue, I am inspired by his leadership, intelligence, and courage, and know that Gene Cernan serves as a role model, not only for myself, but for all past, present, and future Boilermakers with a dream as well. My sincere appreciation to the many uh, dedicated Purdue professors and mentors for teaching and challenging me and to my enthusiastic fellow classmates for elevating my learning experience. The sky is not even the limit for our Southern educational opportunities here at Purdue. Congratulations to Lindsay and Maya. It is an honor to be in your uh, presence and among your talent as an astronaut scholar. I'm extremely grateful to Mr. Hayes and deeply honored to receive this award in commemoration of Gene Cernan. I strive to embody his commitment to excellence in all of my academic and industrial endeavors. And I look forward to the privilege of working with the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation to help future scholars launch their dreams and ensure that America remains at the forefront of technology and innovation. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear the words of the students. It's wonderful to just hear what you're doing and it's the, it's the brightness of the future. It's, it's a kind of a cliche, but it's absolutely true. And I would also, before I turn it over to the q and I would like to call up a pandemic Zoom uh, mistake moment on my part. I feel like I did not properly thank all three sponsors of the astronaut scholarships. Of course, Dick Covey from the Covey Love Fund, 
who really out of the blue came with another scholarship for Purdue and um, we're so honored. It's, it's truly something special uh, with what is happening with you and with us with the scholarship, as well as Jim Hayes, of course. Um, this is, it was the first dedicated scholarship toward Jean Cernan and we really feel how special it is to you. And, and there are lots of stories about Jean Cernan around Purdue. And so we know he's very special to us. Tracy Cernan Willey, you have been, you were here last year as well. I can feel that, you know, there's a good connection there. It's just wonderful to see you. And then of course, again, uh, Mark and Sharon Hagel who are in the off with that third scholarship. So um, we're, just, we're just very grateful and we're just so happy to have you all here. Now with that, I would also like to turn this over to Stephen Collicott and Colonel Dick Covey. Um, I always find that these are kind of a, this is, can be a teaching moment for the students too. The students, they never know what to, um, how to address people, others, and they, they are very uncomfortable with it. So I'm just gonna help you all out. Colonel Covey, goes by Kim Gova by Colonel Covey and uh, Professor Collicott by Professor Collicott. So if you do a verbal questioning, I think we can un unmute you if you have a question, but also we're taking questions in the chat. With that, Professor Collicott, I'm turning to you. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. Um, I normally get to speak for 50 minutes uh, straight, so I'll try to keep it short here. Uh, seriously, students, um, congratulations. Uh, on the behalf of all the professors here, uh, I congratulate each one of you. And it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to meet via Zoom uh, some of our sponsors and, um, and um, <clears throat> Tracy and, and everyone, uh, and Jim Hayes. And um, because it brings to mind uh, before I get into summarizing and, and leading into, which will lead into Q&A, you know, these statements about sky's not the limit, shoot for the moon. I want to share with you that uh, earlier today, I was writing something for a 1993 astronaut scholarship winner. And he is uh, this year's, one of this year's outstanding aerospace engineer award winners here in my department. Colonel Covey is one of them. And, um, uh, just a wide range of uh, engineering leadership successes on Mars orbiters, Mars landers, Mars rovers, including in the trivial trivia pursuit end of it, the largest parachute ever deployed off of Earth. And so this gentleman uh, was a night, like I said, 93 astronaut scholarship winner. Uh, students, please follow his lead. And sponsors, congratulations. This, I think you should see this as part of the impact of, of what you contribute to. And especially Jim Hayes, as this uh, man, Doug Adams, uh, recently won the Neil Armstrong Award of Excellence, which I understand you are uh, involved with creating. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to meet you uh, for that purpose too. So uh, hopefully you all did your homework and um, watched the interview, which was great fun for me to do. Um, I first met Colonel Covey many years ago down in Houston uh, with a group of my students. And so to have time set aside like this to spend one-on-one -on -one with him was really great. And we talked, as you saw, about a number of things. And I was thinking back uh, in the last couple of days preparing for this, what, what would I summarize? And to me, there were uh, two things which are linked. Um, one is this great variety of roles, um, this astronaut, uh, played. Yes, he was an astronaut, but he was also an Air Force pilot. He was also a, 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 a really a supporting engineer when his colleagues were up and flying and then a um, uh, rocket launch industry uh, leader. And so many roles in, in that area. And then um, his answer to a number of my questions related to this and things about there was one I <clears throat> hoped would benefit students about you know did you ever find yourself in a situation where you didn't think you could succeed um, and his frequent answer really came back to really the concept of lifelong learning of figuring out uh, how to do what you need to do and, and learn what you need to do and so th that was 
you know, my summary or what I thought was a, was a short summary, an effective short summary of what uh, Colonel Covey shared with us in the interview was you can do a lot of things and all along the way, you just, you, you apply yourself, you learn how to learn here at school and then you go out and you, you know, apply it and apply it and apply it and apply it uh, over and over again. And uh, Colonel, did I, did I miss something in there? You, you did say it much better than I did. That was fine, Steve. <laughs> And I, Roseanne, I think it's great for uh, student questions. I don't, I don't think I should talk more. Okay. I'm going to open the floor then. Who has a question? I'll give it a moment. I just sent everyone a text saying, would you? Right. Would you turn on your video if you can? And here we are. Real people exist out there in the world. So nice to see your faces. Mm-hmm. I'm not a student, but I would like to ask a question if possible. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm a professor in the College of Education and I'm one of the, the preceptors for the, the one of the honors uh, college, uh, the Silver House. And one of my interests is in studying the role that mentors play in getting K-12 uh, students interested in careers in STEM. So uh, could you talk about the role that the various mentors that I assume you've had over the course of your life played in your career, in, your, in the choices you made and in your, I mean, in your uh, eventual success? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't think much about it often, but uh, I, I was very fortunate in uh, my elementary school days to have a variety of teachers who uh, pushed me uh, and challenged me in different ways. I, I, I remember one in particular is my sixth grade teacher and it's the first um, man that I'd had as a teacher. And uh, I, I uh, felt so challenged by him to, uh, particularly in the area of mathematics, uh, that it became something that I, I loved and, and looked forward to for the rest of my learning days. Uh, and uh, so, Teachers can be uh, very specifically influential in steering uh, young people towards the science, technology, and uh, mathematics. They, they, clearly, they can. Uh, and it's a matter of them probably having the perspective and the right resources to be able to do that and the understanding of it. Um, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation obviously focuses on uh, students at undergraduate students. That's our focus on, on, on uh, and, and, and generally those, those are people that have already chosen STEM as an area of study and profession to some degree. And so, so we, don't, we don't have, you know, our programs aren't focused on the K through 12, but I know there are programs out there that are very much looking at how to encourage uh, uh, foundations and programs uh, to encourage uh, uh, STEM within the uh, early elementary and secondary school. Thank you. Yeah, if you could talk about mentors beyond um, the K-12 K uh, settings, I mean, mentors you had in perhaps also during undergrad or even, I mean, over the course of your life, I was interested. I'm very intrigued by how, I mean, a, one person can make a huge difference, such as the, the, the teacher you mentioned, but finding a, a, a good mentor, someone who's willing to spend time with you, to invest in your, uh, in your um, professional development. So do you see, do you see that as, as, as having been mentors, as having been uh, crucial in your, success and then where you actually, where you got in your career and your life? It, it, in, some, in some places, yes, uh, there were others. I think it was more role models. Uh, I wouldn't call them mentors, but people that I tried to emulate from things they had done. Uh, and, and so that helped establish a pattern of learning and development for me uh, because I knew what they did. Uh, and I'll use the early astronauts as uh, they clearly were a role model for me. They were all military test pilots. I read about them in uh, Life magazine, magazine, 
some of us used to remember being around it. And I learned as much as I could. My, my father was a military pilot. And so the idea that these were military test pilots, I said, hey, you know, I can look at what they've done and I can try to emulate what they've done and be successful where they were successful. And, and that helped me. That was the path forward that I used. Uh, not so much, you know, counseling from an individual, but more so um, having those role models who I wanted to emulate and finding out what they had done and following through on trying to do the things that had been successful for them. Um, probably more when I left astronaut business, I had mentors then that assisted me in my transition into uh, business and becoming an executive for an aerospace company. Uh, very specific ones that if, if they had not basically given me the opportunity to learn from them and to learn what I needed to to be successful in a role as an executive, um, I would not have done as well. Uh, so those were very important for me. Um, very significant contributions by those individuals to my success. There's a question from the live stream from Alvaro Roman. And this person asks, what was the moment you realized that aeronautics was what you wanted to do? What was the moment that I realized that aeronautics, astronautics, what the, well, actually, uh, you know, we, in, in 1961, um, Alan Shepard rode a Redstone rocket suborbitally and became the first American to fly into, technically into space on a rocket. Um, that fascinated me. And that's when I started learning about these other astronauts, the Mercury 7 astronauts, who were going to fly into space, into orbit, ride rockets. Um, I was very intrigued by that. And again, knowing that the path they had taken to get to where they were and, and being in a military family where my father was a military pilot, um, that all looked achievable to me, at least I could see the path forward to maybe someday being able to fly in space. Uh, so I guess that was kind of the moment. Uh, I was never, I never assumed that I would ever reach that ability and actually be able to fly into space, but there was a path to getting there that looked like things that I would enjoy terribly. Uh, flying, test pilot, being a test pilot, uh, using my engineering background in aviation, uh, if I had gone down that path and stayed on it I, and not gotten the opportunity to fly in space, I would have really been uh, quite happy, I believe. Um, the fact that I was lucky and happened to be in the right place at the right time and had done the right things and got to fly in space, that was all bonus. We had a, another question come through the chat. Um, why did you pursue a master's degree instead of pursuing a PhD? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, actually, the, uh, as I was looking at what my path forward was, um, the, the big step for me was to become a uh, Air Force pilot. I went to the Air Force Academy uh, they had a great program in astronautical engineering that I chose as a major. Uh, and one of the benefits of that program was that uh, some of us uh, that were in that program would be able to go to Purdue and get a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics in a relatively short period of time because we were able to take graduate level courses at the Air Force Academy that Purdue accepted in a cooperative program toward a non-thesis master's in aeronautics and astronautics. So uh, by taking those courses uh, while I was at the Air Force Academy, um, then that allowed me to uh, do a 
quick stint through Purdue to complete the requirements for a master's degree and still make my pilot training date the next spring. So basically, uh, it, was a, it was a great program. Uh, I spent seven months at Purdue, uh, received my master's in aeronautics and astronautics, and two months later, I was in Air Force flight training. That was the path I needed to go on. That was the, the, the master's degree was an accelerator for me and all of the other things I wanted to do. Would have a PhD have done uh, as much or more, uh, perhaps, but the time required for that would have taken me away from that major thing I needed to do, which is become uh, a uh, jet pilot. And uh, so it worked out, the master's degree worked out perfectly for me. Okay, there's another question from Kylie Morton. And Kylie says, in your interview, you mentioned having a constant, having to constantly learn a lot of different jobs to perform new jobs or tasks. Was there a particular concept or skill that kept, that kept you through them all, I guess? Oh, that you struggled, oh wait, sorry. Was there a particular concept or skill that you struggled to grasp? Uh, I struggled with less, less. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the uh, fundamental to all of the things that I did, uh, which mostly were operational, uh, e even in, in when I was a business executive, it, it was really operational. Um, the fundamental thing that enables so much of my ability to learn and to understand the business or the activity I was involved in was my engineering education. So uh, what I got at the Air Force Academy and what I got at Purdue uh, basically set the framework for me to be able to uh, go from one technical domain to another uh, and be able to make that transition uh, and, and uh, learn what I needed to to be able to be successful there. Uh, even, as, even as a business executive, uh, the skills and the logical development that comes through engineering and, uh, and science and the application of math. Uh, those, all, those all are fundamental to, uh, for me to becoming a, a successful business person. Um, there's just a lot of key things that transfer. Uh, the ability to uh, evaluate a problem, uh, devise solutions, apply them, measure their success, make them better, all that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it comes right from uh, my engineering background. I have a question. Do you mind, Colonel Covey, if I, am, if I open it to both you and the students? Yep. A question. No. Because <laughs> it is, in the interview, you, we were, um, Professor Colcott asked you about what are the most the really important fields for the future? And you said AI, robotics, and also microbiology. And I would like to know maybe from you sort of why, you, you, said, a lot of, you said something about why AI robotics, but why microbiology? And I would like to hear, if you don't mind, from the students, what they think some of the most important areas are for, I believe it was for space exploration. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke a little bit saying microbiology. I'm really talking about my, microbio or my biology on a, a cellular basis and, ah. and, and stuff. So uh, a, a little bit of a mistake there. I uh, misspoke there a little bit. But, uh, uh, but you know, I, I think that as, you know, as, as I get older, uh, the more I look at the development that's being made in medicine, uh, and that's largely, you know, if you get down into biology as a basis of medicine, um, then the advances that are being made there, I'm going to miss out on uh, in, in uh, sustaining my life longer than it already has been, because I think there's going to be so much more improvement uh, in that area that people will be healthier they'll live longer, 
uh, and they'll and they'll live uh, better lives. Uh, I think that that truly is one of the developments that we're going to that that are we see in that area. Uh, but no, I wouldn't mind hearing what the students think are going to be those areas that really pay off in the next fifty years. I can share <laughs> um, if you guys would like. So um, kind of along those same lines, um, I'm biased in that I am per personally passionate about something called precision medicine. So um, whenever I go to graduate school, I intend to study specifically cancer biology and um, trying to develop precision medicine techniques to treat cancer. So essentially what that means um, to those who are not familiar is Thus far, a lot of cancer treatment has been uh, essentially generalized. So like chemotherapies are just given to everyone with a certain kind of cancer. Um, and it really attacks a lot of the cells in your body and you can get really sick and it's not always that effective. But instead, what you can do is you can use the patient's own immune cells or even um, do kind of like genetic alterations that are specific to that patient um, and specific to their um, presence of cancer that are, have actually proven to be a lot more effective, but are still very much in the early stages of that kind of development. And it's also very expensive currently. Um, so I think that that's where the future of medicine is going to be. I think hopefully in 50 years, we could take a blood sample from somebody and not only have that tell you the exact diagnosis of a person, but tell you the best way to treat them. Mr. I can add on to that uh, a little bit from an aerospace perspective. Um, so first of all, I would uh, totally echo what was said before regarding artificial intelligence and machine learning. That has an incredible potential to um, be a paradigm shift in the way that we handle our urban transportation systems uh, in terms of them making them smart, uh, making smart cities, and uh, ultimately improving the efficiency uh, energy-wise and also time efficiency of um, all our daily lives. Um, on, a, on a broader scale, uh, for all of aerospace, I'm most excited about advanced air mobility and uh, commercial space. Um, so in advanced air mobility, uh, it's really about uh, elevating our transportation system in both a, a figurative and literal sense um, from a 2D uh, street um, platform to 3D, to, to having the ability to fly to your destination uh, instead of driving uh, commute by air. Um, I believe that uh, going back to efficiency and time efficiency of our daily commutes, we have incredible um, opportunity to, uh, to to make our daily lives more impactful um, and then also to be a, a bit more energy conscious uh, in doing so. And then in commercial space, uh, the efforts of, of SpaceX and many other companies have been incredibly exciting in terms of um, decreasing the, the cost per pound of getting payload to orbit. And I hope that one day um, we are able to, to um, harness the, the, uh, the benefits of that and, and perhaps uh, Purdue can op light, open a, a, a true satellite campus uh, up in space. Good idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in here. I just have to add uh, this. I, I, I'm the aerospace engineer, but one of the exciting things I see in the future is this, this whole uh, microbiome issue that uh, we live along with this massive swarm of bacteria that we carry around in us, with us. And the notion that uh, was raised uh, in, in, a, in a meeting this morning that um, you know, if we're going to keep astronauts alive on Mars, we have to keep their microbiome alive too. And our lack of understanding of how all these organisms interact chemically um, and um, digestively and biologically is, is, is uh, our understanding of that is really weak. And I see that as a really a long-term growth area. And then getting into things such as 
in addition to cancer treatment, but other aspects of personalized medicine, other aspects of public health care uh, or public health issues and, and, and so on. So I think that's going to be a, a big area. I think that's where that AI and microbiology may actually end up meeting. Could be. So there is a question from YouTube. Um, and anybody who wants to chime in at any point on this thing, because I know we'd love to hear your thoughts on what's big in the future, just throw it in the chat and say you want to talk or what you want to talk about. But here's a question from YouTube. So it says, from my understanding of talking with other astronauts, many somebody who looked at oh, cool. Many of the early astronauts like the Mercury 7 were from military backgrounds who were thought to have skills and experiences, sorry, I'm <laughs> with the cold, who were the, thought to have skills and experiences to handle extreme environments. With, um, with the completion of the ISS, Many astronauts were chosen with civilian scientific backgrounds to fulfill the science mission. How would you foresee the types, the types of personnel NASA will, will have for future generations of astronauts, especially with planned exhibitions back to the moon and hopefully Mars? Thank you, Colonel Covey, signed Neil. That was a really bad reading. I'm sorry, but I'm having a problem with the scroll. And if you need me to ask something again, I will do it. Sure. Well, the evolution from um, the focus being riding rockets and, and uh, doing scary things in space, like getting there, which was the big deal in the early days, to go into where you're talking about sustaining people for lengthy periods of time doing different type of work has led to uh, the breadth of backgrounds that now are common in our astronaut corps. Um, that's going to continue. Uh, you know, there's there's going to be there's going to be a need for for operators, uh, people who have operational background uh, focused on operations in order to do those things that keep a space station or a space colony or whatever up and working. And then the additional uh, tasks that there may be additional people and, and those operators can be have science backgrounds or not science backgrounds or engineering backgrounds or not engineering backgrounds. And then there'll be those people who'll be focused more on uh, science that may be accomplished so if you think about a, uh, a research ship and you got the scientists on board, but you also have the crew of the ship that has to keep the ship, get the ship to the right place and get to, and keep it running and everything. And then so that the scientists can do their job. It's a mix of backgrounds. It's a mix of skills that are actually applied in the operation. And, and that's going to be true for spaceflight from now on. Uh, it'll be a, it'll be a mix. You're going to want to have a mix of skills and backgrounds and capabilities. I think that that segues into our next question pretty well. Um, what professional and academic advice would you have for someone who wants to work in mission control later? Well, um, I, I would say that that largely uh, most of the people who uh, wind up working in mission control probably have um, engineering backgrounds. Uh, just because the, the operations and, and what they do there are, is a practical application of engineering principles and systems uh, in order to accomplish the mission and support the mission. Uh, so it's largely still going to be an engineering background and multidisciplinary from the standpoint of what type of engineering. Uh, science is always going to be a part of the deep back room, if you would, because uh, there's support that's provided um, for the mission and particularly uh, specific scientific and research efforts that require people in the control center, but maybe not in the front room specifically, but in the back rooms that need to provide that scientific uh, expertise 
they're usually the ones that uh, develop an, a, a system or experiment or some type of operation. And so they're going to, and they're not with it on board, they're going to be with it in the control center. Uh, so again, it's, it's a, a long range of them. If someone is looking for being in the front room of mission control and, and, uh, and supporting the operation of a space station, it's what we have now, or a lunar mission or whatever, I'm predominantly gonna still be engineering. I'm always leaving a few extra seconds because I know people, there's a little bit of delay on Zoom where, where they throw things in the chat or unmute to ask. I have noticed that with astronauts, you're an astronaut for, you know, a certain segment of your life. And you talked about this in the interview, uh, Colonel Covey, that there were, you know, you go through these various segments um, and they each kind of lead into each other, I kind of, I assume. Today's students, I don't even remember exactly what the statistic is, but it's like, they're going to have 20 different jobs over the course of their lifetime. So in a way, they can look forward to that kind of life. So I always talk about the students with about, about moving forward with intentionality, knowing that your job's going to change, knowing that new possibilities would open up. How has it been, how did you make those moves from the one to the next? Did they just drop in your lap? Was it, how much intention did you put into it? Like, like do you know, have you been able to notice like what was the generator behind it all? Probably different from everyone, uh, for everyone. If I think back about not, you know, particularly people that I know that went through the astronaut corps at some time, we all uh, had different ways of getting there. Some was more a afterthought uh, and just being the right person at the right time and doing it. Others, it was a lot of, of forethought and preparation uh, in order to be in the right place at the right time to get selected. Uh, I'd like to think that, that uh, I always was, I was always looking uh, not at my next job, you know, not the current job, I'm thinking about the next one, but I'm also figuring out, all right, if I wanna get to that next job, what do I have to do between what I'm doing now and what I, what I do, did then? Um, the, the fundamental thing though, is the number one job has, is not, about, is not about thinking where you're gonna go next. It's about being the best you can be at the role you're in. Yes, doing that leads to opportunities. I won't say they get dropped in your lap, but it opens doors. Uh, and, but they have to be doors you're looking for. You have to, you have to know what you're looking, what you, wanna, what you wanna do or where you wanna lead to. And not everybody wants to do that. Not a lot of people are happy uh, where they wind up, where they are, and they stay there. Um, but uh, uh, I always, I always looked at how I was going to grow out of the job I was in into the next one, and uh, and sometimes that was a career, it was the next career. How am I going to grow out of this career into my next career, and then within that career, how am I going to grow? Uh, what have I got to do? What have I got to learn? Uh, how, what are going to be my own personal performance metrics to say I'm doing the right things. I've, I've done the right things in order to open that next door. Um, it, it, it really, I think every, everybody has their own drummer and the own beat they want to follow. Uh, and uh, you, you, you need to, you need to keep that path visible and have an idea of what it is. And again, that was my use of role models. I looked at what people had done and how they had transitioned and what they had done. And I even did that when I was an astronaut. I looked at former astronauts that I had worked with who had left and where they had gone and what they were doing and how they had done that. And I said, okay, uh, you know, I, I can see what I need to do to be able to follow in their steps to go off and do something else and be successful at it. I love that metaphor of looking for the doors 
I'm definitely going to use that with students later on. <laughs> they, you have to know what doors you're looking for in the first place. That's very nice. Um, I would like to do the polite Zoom etiquette thing and wrap this up pretty soon to have people have a slightly shorter than an hour um, session. Can I ask right now, kind of give a last call for questions? We do have a question that just came in. <clears throat> um, so for Colonel Covey, um, you talked about lifelong learning as an important skill. What other skills do you see as important for the success, um, uh, for success in space-related fields in addition to um, lifelong le learning? Um, you know, if, if, I look at, if I look at it generally, I'd say uh, uh, flexibility, and adaptability uh, are, are probably uh, the greatest skills. With all the change that happens in a dynamic area, a growth area, if you would like now, space transportation, I'll use that as a, a, generic, a generic. If you look at that, you, you gotta be ready to, to, to change and, and adapt to uh, new technologies, new approaches, uh, and flexible enough then to be able to take what your role is and, and move it in that right direction. Uh, so I guess those would be the things I'd say. Those are really good, um, some good advice for life generally, I would say. Um, Colonel Covey, thank you for this time. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone on the call does on behalf of Astro Scholarship Foundation, if I may speak on their behalf, thank you for this. And on behalf of Purdue University, definitely. I'd like to thank everyone else who uh, contributed, uh, Tracy Cernwilly, Jim Hayes, Stephen Collicott, of course, the students, Lindsay Wilson, Zach Marshall, Zachary Marshall, and Maya Claire. So it's good to have you all here. Thank you for everyone in the audience for coming, um, whether you're listening on the live stream or you're here in the room. It's been very nice to have you all here. And with that, I would like to conclude our, our astronaut award and question and answer session. Thank you, Rosie.